Bon après-midi à tous et à toutes. Alors, bienvenue à la conférence « Le Canada en tartan », présentée dans le cadre de la série « L'envers du McCord », une série qui est faite par les conservateurs et les autres spécialistes du musée et qui dévoile les richesses et les histoires des vastes collections du musée McCord. Avant de rentrer dans le vif du sujet, nous voudrions tout d'abord reconnaître que le musée McCord est situé en territoire autochtone non cédé. Aussi, nous reconnaissons la nation Guénengéaga comme gardienne de ces terres appelées « Diodiagé » par leurs membres. Montréal est historiquement connu comme un lieu de rassemblement pour de nombreuses nations autochtones et leurs ancêtres, et nous la rendons hommage à eux et à tous ceux d'autres communautés qui pourraient être ici aujourd'hui parmi nous. Donc, je vais vous parler de la conférence d'aujourd'hui. Today, we have the great pleasure to welcome you to a lecture entitled Get Your Tartan On, presented by Cynthia Cooper, curator of dress, fashion, and textile here at the Mecker Museum. This presentation will delve into the checkered past of many Canadian tartan designed in the mid-60s, including the maple leaf tartan. Please note that the lecture will be in English, but you're invited to participate in the question period in both languages, French or English. Also, we inform you that the lecture and question period will be recorded. Notez que la conférence aura lieu en anglais, mais que vous pouvez participer à la période de questions en français ou en anglais à la suite de la présentation de Cynthia. Aussi, je souligne que la conférence et la période de questions vont être captées et enregistrées. Je prends aussi quelques minutes pour vous présenter notre conférencière. Donc, détentrice d'une maîtrise des sciences en costumes et textiles historiques de la University of Rhode Island, Cynthia Cooper est conservatrice de la collection Costumes, Mode et Textiles au Musée McCord depuis 20 ans. Elle supervise depuis la plus grande collection muséale de vêtements canadiens regroupant plus de 20 000 pièces. Cynthia Cooper agit également comme chef des collections et de la recherche ici au musée. Elle a obtenu trois fois le Richard Martin Exhibition Award de la Costume Society of America et le plus récent lui a été remis pour l'exposition Mode Expo 67 en 2018. Cynthia Cooper takes a particular interest in fashion and entangled within Canadian and Quebec identity projects. She regularly takes part in publication and conferences. Today's lecture is an elaborate ver version of a presentation that she delivered in Florence last November as part of the Costume Colloquium and inter international, international Forum that encourages the exchange of ideas and knowledge on all aspects of historical dress, costume, contemporary fashion, and textiles. Euh, donc, ça va être à, à son tour de, de s'adresser à vous. On vous invite euh, aussi à rester à la suite, pour, euh, à, à la suite de, la, de, de la discussion de la période de questions pour partager un verre de thé qui est gracieusement offert par l'été David City, donc de ce côté. Je vais donc euh, laisser maintenant la, la parole à Cynthia et la remercie de, de la présentation qu'elle nous offre aujourd'hui. Merci. Bon, merci, Marie-Andrée Bon après-midi. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for coming. Um, so... Uh, It's often very chilly in this theater, so I decided to dress in something warm. And I thought, what better than this uh, cape, a vintage cape from the 1970s. This is in my family, Tartan, which is here. Uh, it's a steward of Butte. So if you've come here knowing next to nothing about tartans, and I, I see many of you wearing tartans, so I, I assume that's not the case for all of you, but you know that they are textiles with repeating patterns of stripes that cross each other to create a grid design. And you probably also know that they are associated with Scottish families or clans. And yes, Uh, I have ancestry that goes back to one of these clans, um, a paternal ancestor on my mother's side who left the Kyles of Butte uh, in the 1780s and settled in Nova Scotia. And so, hence, my tartan is known as Stuart of Butte uh, because it's one of the septs or subdivisions of the Stuart clan. So I find um, that the fact that I have birthright to a lovely textile like this, appeals to me at a deep level, and I wear it because it connects me to my ancestor and descendants of that same clan that are now worldwide. But today I want to dig deeper into the capacity of Tartan to connect people, and so now I'm going to spend much of the rest of my talk telling you how everything I've just said is wrong, or what's wrong with what I've just said. <laughs> So the idea that tartans represent clans is not uh, that old. Um, it really dates back to about the, 18, the early 1820s, 1822, 
um, when King George IV paid a visit to Edinburgh and Sir Walter Scott uh, organized uh, uh, some events that were very much pageantry and made the suggestion that um, clans uh, adopt a tartan that they could wear for this event. My ancestor has been, was in, arrived in Nova Scotia almost 40 years before that event. And consider also um, famous events in the history of tartans, um, the, uh, the act of British Parliament known as the Dress Act or the act of prescription that banned tartan uh, in the Scottish Highlands except for uh, those who were in military service of the king. That occurred in 1746. And my ancestor was born only 10 years later. So he would not have been born into a world wearing tartan. And when that act was repealed, 1782, he was probably already on the boat. So, um, and even if we look at this painted image of the Marquis of Butte uh, in 1820, and we see him wearing a tartan, well, it's not this one. So if my ancestor could see me um, choosing and wearing this tartan to create a connection with him, he would probably find it quite odd. Um, and so for a very long time, tartan has been bound up with romantic myth. And by wearing this, I've cloaked myself in a myth. And so even though this talk is called Get Your Tartan On, as a historian, I want to uh, get beneath the myth and uh, <laughs> tell some of the, see what's beneath. But I'm still a little chilly, so I'm going to put on something else. <laughs> um, so because, perhaps because of its embeddedness in myth, Tartan has always been what a colleague of mine calls a textile of contradiction. Like this idea of connection through tartan. It connects us to a group, but only if we want to use it that way. There are no tartan police that check to see if we have the right to wear the tartans we wear. And its symbolic potential is there only if we invest it that way. And one of the ways that we invest tartan with that symbolic power is by making these textiles tartans, which means registering them or seeking the approval of an official body. So there is a Scottish Tartans Authority and a Scottish Register of Tartans um, that, that recognize and record new tartans as they're created. And a recent article in La Presse last year suggested about eight new tartans are registered a week, and many of them come from um, uh, Japan. And so if you look at the loc locations and the reasons and what new tartans are commemorating, in contemporary context, its meanings appear to be firstly about belonging or commemorating, and its Scottishness is of much lesser relevance in these new tartans. But on the other hand, we have the ri a rise of popular culture like Outlander or films like Braveheart that continue to reinforce the ideas of Scottishness in tartans. So I say this by way of explaining how they are textiles of contradiction. So registering a tartan is what distinguishes a tartan from a plaid. And um, this, uh, which you might call plaid, is actually a tartan. It's known as Rob Roy. Um, and uh, of course, that's the, the plaid is, is what, how North Americans refer to checkered textiles that are not registered. In the UK, they would call them checked. And the plaid, or plaid, as it might be pronounced, is, a, is an actual uh, garment or, or a large square fabric worn with the kilt. And so while we're on terminology, um, Another term that's important is set. So a set in a tartan means the sequence of threads and their colors, the numbers of threads and their colors. So for instance, this tartan would be registered as having the set of 32 red yarns and 32 black yarns. And this is how we distinguish tartans from each other by their sets. And a tartan uh, is usually, doesn't have to be, but a twill weave. And so in a twill weave, um, in a balanced twill weave, two warp go over two weft, um, and they are staggered so that when you weave uh, two colors or more, you have these solid areas, like solid red and black, and then you have these shaded area areas where you see uh, a mixture of the two colors and a distinct diagonal line. And so most uh, woolen, uh, uh, most tartans executed in woolens are, are twill weaves. 
And tartans are not just entangled with Scottishness and with belonging, but also with fashion. So whether or not you know that you know, you do know several tartans, and you recognize their sets, and I am going to show you that. Uh, so you know the Royal Stuart, which is said to be the most widely worn tartan in the world. It's a fashion tartan. And um, many would say um, that we all have the right to wear it because it's the Queen's tartan, and so as her subjects, uh, we have the, the right to, we all serve her, we have the right to wear it. Others would say the opposite, that it's really only restricted to the royal family. And you also know the Black Watch, which is a regimental tartan, which is now considered a generic tartan that anyone can wear. So I'm legitimate in what I'm wearing here beneath my scarf. And of course, you know Rob Roy, which is the simplest of all tartans design, tartan designs, which has had a very strong fashion presence in the past decade. And this was not always the case, because we have a letter here in the McCord archives um, uh, that tells a different story, and it's dated from 1826. And it's a Montreal merchant writing to his English supplier. And he tells him that he is stuck with two pieces of a very bad pattern called Rob Roy, which pattern will not take in this market. So that was almost two centuries ago. So he might be surprised to realize that. <laughs> We have co-opted it as almost an official tartan. Some people would think that it belongs to Quebec, although this book on the symbol of, symbols of Canada also uses it on their cover. And uh, Roots uses it widely in their logo. And um, uh, the Americans uh, more often call it buffalo plaid and also tout it as a particularly American uh, design. Um, so to come back to this um, idea, though, of what is so appealing about tartan, I think aside from the, the colorful graphic design, it's the idea of belonging. Um, and so even while it's a uh, symbol of the establishment, as we see here, worn by the royal family, um, it's also used uh, to create connection through subversion. So we've seen that with the punk movement, uh, where tartan has, has uh, widely uh, been adopted. Uh, so again, it's the idea of connection through some of these contradictions. Uh, so now that we've covered this background, what I'd really like to talk about are Canada's own tartans, specifically those were, that were created mid-century in the 1950s and 1960s. And if you didn't know Canada had tartans, um, don't worry. Uh, there's really very little reason that you would know that unless you live or grew up like I did in a province that particularly promoted theirs. Uh, and Canada's uh, official tartan, um, my contention is that it could not be more obscure as an official symbol. Um, so the first regional tartan is this one. It came into being in Nova Scotia in 1953. And at this time in Nova Scotia, uh, in, uh, it's, it's a very ethnically mixed population. Scots were a small percentage, perhaps 10%. And yet that province in the second quarter of the 20th century had really aligned its heritage with the Scottish essence, uh, following um, a well-documented anti-modern impulse that was mobilized to stimulate a burgeoning tourism into industry. And so a craft center in Cape Breton um, that we see here, Gaelic College, um, introduced weaving courses, and that provided a stimulus for some tentative experiments in tartan weaving. And uh, the government created a handicrafts division uh, and tasked it with fostering an authentic, and I say that you know, in quotation marks, handicrafts tradition for the province um, that supported growth of this facility and its weaving capacity. And so the conceiving of the Nova Scotia Tartan in 1953 has been described um, as a mayor, major triumph of the government department in question, the Handicrafts Division. And its creation was rather accidental. It was intended for a mural that um, uh, included, was to include a de depiction of an archetypal Nova Scotian shepherd which they decided should be wearing a kilt. He's here, and he's over here. And to not favor any particular clan tartan, um, uh, the weaver, the maker of the uh, mural, uh, made up her own. And so she created, created her set by drawing inspiration from the landscape. 
And for instance, her predominant blue was that of the sea and the sky. The two greens represented evergreen and deciduous trees. The white was for the rocks and the surf, and the red and gold for the lion rampant on the crest of the provincial flag. And her individual initiative, uh, which was really irrespective of any genuine condition, connection to history, fit perfectly with the objectives of the not so successful handicrafts division, which had not yet developed in our artisan tradition for the province. And at the same time, it was also an impetus for a company uh, that this weaver founded that developed textiles and clothing for commercial purposes, and then others that created products sold as tourist souvenirs. So this tartan was soon adopted as the province's visual identity. And I think it's telling for me, uh, born a decade after it was created, I cannot recall ever not knowing what this was, or not knowing what a tartan was. Uh, so for well over half a century now, blue tartan authenticates a visit to the province. And that doesn't mean that Nova Scotians go around wearing it. And in fact, permanent residents, if they own any, are more likely to keep it in the back of their closets. Um, and uh, the fact that I have this scarf is typical uh, because I'm out of province and I received it from somebody uh, also out of province as a gift. So <laughs> it's the kind of thing also, uh, for a while I wore it and I had an unfortunate incident in Toronto um, when somebody um, said, oh, do you work for Sobeys? which is a Nova Scotian-owned grocery store, and then I realized that they're in Toronto, um, that uh, the store employees must wear a uniform with a bit of this on it. So it was a bit more of a, of a statement of belonging than I had intended to make that I didn't feel quite comfortable with. So it was the Nova Scotia tartan that led the way for the other Canadian provinces, towns, and cities, and the occasional institution like Simpson's department store to create their own tartans in the 1950s and the first half of the 60s. And I'd like to emphasize that there was no similar phenomenon occurring in the U.S. Uh, state of tartans there only began to appear in the late 80s and early 90s. So the eastern provinces of New Brunswick, PEI, and Newfoundland uh, soon followed Nova Scotia, commissioning and registering their designs. And as Nova Scotia's tartan did, they chose color symbolism to reference nature. And I think that that's totally a mid-century idea. So these colors all related to their landscape and features, sometimes some fauna, and to a, a lesser extent, armorial bearings, um, and occasionally a line of color symbolizing a founding people. And these tartans quickly became very successful tourist products when introduced to an existing market of visitors uh, who wanted to acquire something to take back home. And so by the early 60s in Canada, these tartans were entrenched as a popular and commercially successful genre of uh, regional symbol. So as Canada's centennial neared in 1967, we had all these tartans as regional symbols, and there was a context that was particularly favorable to the self-conscious creation of a variety of national symbols. It was a moment of great optimism and pride, and one tempered by a certain amount of public controversy about aesthetics and identity. And so these symbols included Canada's flag, launched in 1965, the Centennial logo launched the following year, and then the logo for uh, Man and His World, uh, and, uh, because the Centennial year was to be marked by Expo 67. Um, so with all these symbols in the air, uh, commercial opportunities arriving, arising from the celebratory period also inspired individual initiatives, several of which happened to be specifically tartans. And I think now that I've warmed up enough, I can put my, my scarf away. Um, so an opportunity appeared to David Weiser, who was vice president of a Toronto-based garment company called Highland Queen Sportswear Limited. And Weiser at this time was in his mid-50s. He had a few decades of experience in the industry, and he described himself as one of Canada's foremost textile designers. And so he began planning a tartan that would be specifically Canadian, which was this. Um, so to media, he explained later, after he'd created this, that most tartans didn't really make up into clothing very well, and that to have enduring popularity, a tartan needed a subdued color scheme. So according to his grandson, he took an existing red and green plaid, plaid and he added three lines of color, 
a gold, a medium brown, and a dark brown, which you see here. You see it really in the square with it. And um, this uh, produced an asymmetrical set, which is not typical of most traditional tartans. Uh, and he christened it the maple leaf tartan after the symbol that had been chosen for Canada's flag, and he promoted the colors as symbolic of its life cycle. So his official marketing materials described how green is the color of the, the early color of the foliage, the gold appears at the turn of autumn, the red shows up with the coming of the first frost, the tones of brown find their way throughout the leaf, creating a prolific profusion of color. He registered the tartan as an industrial design in Canada in 1964, as well as in the US and UK patent offices, and stated on record that he had really wanted to save it for 1967, but that it was too good to keep back from the market. And he began to promote it vigor vigorously. So when Canada's dairy princess, a 19-year-old Margaret Boyko, uh, went to London in September of 1964, she wore this outfit that you see here on a model, uh, for her official duties. And somehow she caught the eye of the Queen Mother who expressed interest in the tartan. And so at, in December, at a fashion show presented by the Incorporated Society of London Fashion Designers at Covent Garden, um, uh, the designer uh, Angèle Delange, who was actually a, a London designer of Belgian uh, origin, uh, presented this dress, which is today in the... Um, collection of the Royal Ontario Museum, and um, you see one view of it with the cape over it and one view uh, without the cape. Other celebrity promoters included Anne Sidney, who you see here, Miss World, who was given this fireside outfit to model, and Guy Lombardo, whose big band, the Royal Canadians, was outfitted in tartan dinner jackets. In March 1965, Weiser declared that his tartan ready-to-wear line was one of the most successful his firm had ever produced. And the federal government placed orders for both male and female staff of the Department of Trade and Commerce for trade shows abroad. And the province of Ontario's economics and development min minister declared that their blazers, which would be these, had already changed Canada's image. Highland Queen's new licensing company, Rotex, accorded rights to Canadian manufacturers. So for men and women, there were shirts um, by Forsyth uh, that also made a lot of neckties. And you can see here a Forsyth tie in our collection with um, the original tags, which show how it was a design that was not intended, or that the maker intended to not have copied. Um, Claire Haddad, a lingerie designer, produced this line with gold nylon tricot topped by wool tartan robes. There was a children's wear line. We have this little dress here in our collection, um, and you see it there in uh, Eaton's catalog. There were glove and scarf sets. There were hats by uh, Biltmore. And all in all, Rotex had licensees producing school supplies, luggage, dolls like this one, blankets, even car seat covers, you know, for those long bench type seats, and bone china. There's a, there's a maple leaf tartan pattern. Uh, a U.S. company, Sport Tempos, acquired exclusive U.S. rights and brought out 75 different styles in coordinates. Now, in 1965, Noting that two Canadian provinces, this was so successful, that's, this is why this happened. Noting that there were still two Canadian provinces that didn't yet have their own official tartans, Weiser stepped in and proposed and licensed tartans for the provinces of Ontario and Quebec, along with one for the Niagara Falls region. And Rotex announced that together with its licensees, it expected to generate $10 million in retail sales, 500,000 of which was to be in the US, and which was going to double to 20 million. Uh, by the time of the centennial. So this was the um, Ontario tartan that he created, which he called the Ensign of Ontario because it was based on the, the uh, armorial bearings of the province. And in this case, Ontario kept this as their official tartan until the year 2000 when they replaced it uh, with a new design. He also designed the very, very little known uh, Plaid du Québec, which is our unofficial official tartan. 
uh, because we, uh, Quebec is the only province that has never officialized uh, its tartan, and yet if you go looking for a tartan to wear to represent Quebec, uh, this is it. Um, so its symbol symbolism is also derived from the uh, armorial bearings, blue for the field of the upper division containing the three fleurs de lys, green for the sprig of maple leaves on the lower division, red for the background of the center division, gold for the lion rampant in the third division and also for the crown, and white for the scroll with the motto, Je me souviens. So uh, Quebec has accepted, uh, has recognized Tartan Day officially uh, since 2003. This remains our best option if we're looking for a tartan to wear. Nonetheless, vintage pieces in the Quebec, uh, Plaid du Québec are, are very, very rare. Um, and I have found two instances where I recognize it being worn. One is by Don Cherry. <laughs> yes. Um, the other is this evening dress by a New York-based designer, Canadian-born, named Michael Kay, uh, who produced this for an annual charity fashion show in New York called Dress to Kilt. Um, and he likes to pull out Canadian tartans uh, to do that. Uh, if you're interested in Plaid du Québec, Right here at the McCord Boutique, we have a few items for you. And uh, you might also want to watch Radio Canada on Thursday at 7.30, Info Man. Um, my crystal ball tells me that he will be sporting some Plaid du Québec this Thursday. Um, so with all this money to be made producing Canadian tartans, not surprisingly, there were other companies that got in on the game. And second only to the maple leaf tartan, but now almost entirely forgotten, is this one, the Centennial Tartan. So this tartan, in fact, was designed in 1957 for the first of BC's centennial celebrations in 1958. BC has three different centennials. It's very confusing. The first one was 1958, and this was created by Henry C. Weller of Vancouver. Um, and at the time... Its symbolism was described, uh, as you can sort of see here, it's a centennial tartan to commemorate 100 years of glorious history of British Columbia. And then they talk about the color symbolism, uh, the blue of the Pacific Ocean, the gold of the crown, also of the sun, the white and red of the cross of St. George, depicting our bond with the Commonwealth, white for the dogwood, the provincial floral emblem, and green of BC's mighty forests. So for reasons I'm not yet clear on, the tartan was made, it was advertised, it was sold, um, but it was not really officialized for this centennial. And so with the Canadian centennial on the horizon, it was the perfect opportunity to revive the design and rewrite its story, which remained very mutable, as tartans do. Their symbolism is very mutable. And um, uh, so its symbolism was adapted for the Canadian centennial. So one version referred to its main block having 50 threads in each direction for the 100 years of Confederation. Red and white, this time, for the proud bands of the Canadian flag, each with 12 threads to represent the provinces and territories. And another version stated that the blue and green represented two founding peoples, which was really a fairly progressive acknowledgement of French Canada for the time, but it also showed how deep was Canada's erasure of its indigenous peoples. The Centennial Tartan promoters also granted licenses to a variety of manufacturers. So there were, of course, women's coordinates, as you see here in this outfit from our collection. Um, an article in a national magazine showed loungewear, nightgowns and bathrobes, uh, children's wear, and my favorite, the swimsuit. <laughs> and it appeared even in Eaton's catalog on rain boots, and uh, my most recent find, which we haven't acquired yet, the baby stroller for your 1967 baby. Um, and one of the licensees was the Canadian Rehabilitation Council, uh, which produced items artisanally in craft workshops, and I'm quoting, so the handicapped and disabled join in and benefit from Canada's birthday. And uh, I mention this because I want to highlight the ethos of inclusion in that kind of statement. And also, Alberta's provincial tartan had originated in that same workshop. So consumers also eagerly purchased Centennial Tartan. 
uh, this girl from the Child's family of British Columbia wore a dress. And in fact, everyone in her extended family got an item to wear. Um, a Quebec City textile firm, Pick Mills, also launched and registered a series of 10 provincial tartans, which you see here sold as yardage uh, in a mail order catalog, uh, along with one to represent Canada, which is made up into the dress. And since all provinces now had uh, a tartan, these are in fact a second alternative set of provincial tartans, as if one wasn't enough. enough. Um, all were based on the same set, but realized it just in different colorways. And Rotex tried to obtain a court injunction uh, to present, prevent pick mills from distributing and advertising these tartans and was un unsuccessful. And in fact, one could easily see the confusion. Um, it's not so obvious in the coloring of the set diagram here, but this is an actual um, pick mills tartan beret in PEI tartan. And would you know that it was not the maple leaf? Tartan, just looking at it, so you can see why they may have felt uh, concern. A, a weekly fashion show at Expo 67 featured a whole tableau of garments uh, created by mostly Montreal's design, designers made in tartans from the Pick Mill series, uh, including this back, backless dress um, in Saskatchewan tartan by Lionel and Elvia. Uh, British Columbia Tartan Coat and Tam by John Warden, Montreal designer. An Alberta Tartan Jumpsuit with a big zipper in front, uh, also by John Warden. Uh, Nova Scotia Tartan Jumpsuit uh, by Val Hughes, Montreal designer as well. And then the Ontario Tartan Plus Eights and Vest by Morris Watkin, who was an Ontario designer. So these, these outfits, we've seen them in footage of fashion shows that took place at Expo, as well as being featured in this magazine spread. And we also know that the Maple Leaf Tartan Tam that you see here uh, was purchased uh, by the donor at Expo. So there were still more designs, and in fact, that the fact that I have um, uh, over an hour here, um, I still can't, I can only scratch the surface. Um, so this uh, was called the Cento Plaid, and this was described as a tartan for young adults. Uh, and it was commissioned by a company called Trafalgar Sport Sportswear. And the, the company president said, this is our centennial project. Almost everyone today is planning something. The Cento Plaid is ours. And although it's strikingly similar to the Maple Leaf Tartan, it lacks the asymmetry. And I suspect Rotex did not sue because this tartan was not licensed to other companies. It was just not disseminated beyond this brand. So another textile company launched a Fathers of Confederation series of at least six more tartans uh, that were made up by a garment company into mini kilts and pant dresses with uh, wide slit skirts. And Simpson's department store designed and promoted its own company tartan, uh, Glen Aaron. So given that these tartans were sold as fashion, the way in which they served their implied intent of drawing the nation together in celebration of, their, of its 100th anniversary is necessarily full of its entanglements. For instance, as fashion, they played up a stereotypically Scottish sartorial vocabulary in the occasional outfit, and to a lesser extent, some of the broader Anglophile trends in popular culture of the 60s. And yet, these were the cultures that Canada was actively distancing itself from, its colonial origins, um, which was a significant cultural shift that was now co coalescing with the new flag in the World's Fair. And so this context foregrounds how the tartan's color symbolism uh, inspired by Canada's landscape and peoples uh, was about highlighting Canada's distinctness as a territory over any affinity with co colonial powers. And I think we see that here in this model with the tartan outfit uh, for, on the cover of the Star Weekly standing on a Canadian flag. These are about saying Canada is distinct. Um, this is some, these tartans were something new. They weren't about creating um, a link to Scotland. But beyond their appeal as fashion, the ambiguity over their Scottishness fueled a debate that was lurking in some corners over the appropriateness of tartans as symbols for Canada. And this debate, I thought it appeared in the 60s, and very recently I found that it appeared 
even in the early 40s. Uh, because even a decade before Nova Scotia had created and adopted its first regional tartan, uh, this one was designed uh, in 1942 for the Royal Canadian Air Force. It's probably the earliest well-known Canadian tartan. And an opinion piece uh, that I read from 1943 voiced a complaint that by putting this tartan in kilts for airmen or airmen's pipe bands, um, that brought the uniform too close to British expectations of what a uniform should be, and therefore it was a, a deterrent to developing a unique national sentiment. Um, it almost says almost directly that tartan posed a threat to national unity in Canada. Um, but by the mid-60s, these deep regional and political and linguistic divisions um, in the new ways Canada was defining itself as a nation were coming to the fore. And these tartans were not regimental uniforms, they were fashion, so they were being consumed by a much wider swath of Canadians. In 1966, one Scottish Canadian was sensitive to the ambiguity of their popularity as fashion and wrote a letter to Lester B. Pearson to say that the store window displays and hang tags for the maple leaf tartan to the uninitiated convey the idea that this is the official Canadian tartan. And he called on the government to take action to establish and authenticate a national tartan to eliminate the confusion and recognize the founding role of Scots in the country. And even though it's a lone complaint, it's important because the state's uh, negative response to his request makes clear our, the official position that, quote, a national symbol should be, as much as possible, common to all ethnic groups in the country. And he actually wrote back to say, well, the maple leaf is not common to all ethnic groups in the country. Um, and then fashion editor Iona Monaghan, she may have appreciated these as fashion, but when she wrote the copy to accompany her fashion spread of tartan, garments. Um, she wasn't <laughs> buying into this celebratory nationalism either, and she referred to these textiles as ersatz Canadian tartans that in a peculiar way proved just how divided a nation we are and labeled the outfits as symbols of our national disunity. And it's very ironic in spite of rising French Canadian nationalism uh, which might have seen this idea of nation building through a British fashion tradition or vocabulary as anathema. This is uh, from the magazine Actualité, which promoted the glove and scarf sets as a lovely gift idea and endorsed them as a way to wear Canadian nationalism autour du cou or around the neck. And at least one other um, later attempt to create a national tartan around the mid-2000s met with the same concern, that the symbol would be seen as serving the interests of one ethnic group and would not serve the cause of multiculturalism and unity. Um, and yet, in fact, there's plenty of evidence that the vision of the creators of, the, of these tartans um, of the 60s, the maple leaf, and the centennial was one of inclusion of a multicultural Canada wearing tartan garments and consuming tartan products. And this is a promotional brochure for the centennial tartan. Um, and uh, I think it's interesting, does anyone recognize what's in the lower half? Have you seen that in the museum recently? Mm -hmm. And Kent Monkman also uses this uh, image of the Fathers of Confederation um, uh, in his uh, 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 statement. Um, but uh, so here, uh, one of the fathers is depicted as saying, I tell you, t John, it will take 100 years to design a really all Canadian tartan. And then here's what the inside of their brochure, which was really intended for um, uh, licensees, um, this is what it says. It's for the McGurks and the McTurks, the McCohens, the McCostopoluses, the McBouchers, and the McVanderlindens, maybe even the Pasquales. All have something at last to identify with. Coast to coast, uh, millions of Canadians of all origins are going to be wearing the centennial tartan. And then on the far side, although today we recognize these caricatures as problematic and offensive, but I think that this was in the maker's intent, a way of bringing indigenous people into that picture of who could wear it. You don't have to be a Scot to wear the centennial carton, tartan under those, uh, those caricatures. Um, and maple leaf tartan, although their statement about inclusion was not as direct, was a little more cumbersome, but David Weiser also said things 
uh, in binary terms, young and old, um, male or men or men and women, and dark or fair. So I think that was a statement where he was intending to include all Canadians. And another very interesting proponent of the tartan was uh, media scholar Marshall McLuhan, who I've seen in a few, a couple of images now wearing both the blazer and the tie. Um, in 69, he sent a tam o to uh, Prime Minister Pierre Elliott Trudeau, who he had not yet met, and um, uh, recommended it to him because of his Scottish ancestry. But it appears to be sort of somewhat tongue-in-cheek, and both these men were ardent proponents of a multicultural Canada. So what happened to these tartans after 1967? Well, the Centennial Tartan and the Centennial Provincial C Series, the advertising stopped pretty much immediately. And the Maple Leaf uh, Tartan endured for a while, although it never got back the momentum it had in the mid-1960s. Uh, following a survey of Americans done in 1967, and a discovery that they drew particularly, as, or what I guess the question asked was, what do you most associate Can Canadians with? And the answer was tartan. And is it any wonder with what I've just shown you? Um, Canadian Pacific chose the maple leaf tartan as their uh, uniform on Vancouver or San Francisco flights for a while. And Highland Queen used it in bankruptcy, uh, used it in clothing until their bankruptcy in the mid 70s. And interestingly, they tried to revive the plaid du Québec and bring it back in 76 as the Olympicana tartan. So they made the colors are the same, the set is the same, except that they've woven the Olympic logo into the red squares. And um, uh, so that worked well for about a year and then also disappeared. And like, like every, anything good, um, it spawned a lot of copying. So even though, well, the, when, when the company went bankrupt, but I think before, because David Weiser's grandson tells me um, these big US companies could do anything that they want, uh, Pendleton Woolen Mills was using the same design. So here it is, it's in a plain weave, it doesn't read quite the same, um, but they've used it in a shirt. And in fact, from what I can tell, Pendleton's was using it as a fashion tartan through the 1990s, from the things I find on, on eBay, um, but not, uh, not calling it, uh, no label inside that would say it was maple leaf tartan. Um, and like anything good, it also spawned a series of fakes. So in this picture, you see a model wearing what looks to be an identical um, uh, skirt and cape. But when we zoom in close, what I want you to see is um, how in the cape, you see the three lines, the gold, the medium, and the oh, sorry, gold, medium brown, dark brown. You see that? Um, or down here, you can see the, shade, the three shades gold, medium, dark, and here in the skirt, it's a symmetrical tartan with the gold in the center flanked by medium brown and no dark. So this is what American, some American companies were using to imitate the, the maple leaf tartan uh, while it was still, the design was still registered. Um, also, the Scottish Register of Tartans, that official body that I mentioned to you about, keeps track of the sets, but they make mistakes. And so there's a mistake out there in how the maple leaf tartan should be woven. So if you find contemporary tartan, uh, you will almost always see, uh, so the skirt here is made in the old tartan, so you see gold, medium, dark. Uh, but here in the shawl, they forget the, the new fabric skips the dark brown and they put a wider band of medium brown. So what you see is no dark brown. It's sort of like one narrow band of gold and then a wider band of... Uh, of uh, brown. And here on this table, which you can come and look at afterwards, I have uh, uh, lengths of fabric that show in these three variations. So I've now, you are now trained, you are the first cohort of trained <laughs> maple leaf tartan fraud experts, and uh, you can come and practice over here um, afterwards. So, but by and large, the tartan was largely forgotten in Canada until 2011 when a senator from PEI brought forward a bill for its recognition. And following her arguments, the Minister of Canadian Heritage uh, acted very quickly 
uh, too quickly to her liking and um, made it an official symbol. And here's how he uh, announced it in the official, in his speech and in the official press release. Our national symbols express our identity and define our history. The maple leaf tartan represents the contributions that the more than 4 million Canadians of Scottish heritage continue to make to our country. Now his declaration marks a distinct evolution in the discourse surrounding the maple leaf tartan since its creation. And I expect that for both the obscurity of its history, I mean, who else knows this, and for the considerable growth of uh, what I will call tartanry in Scotland over the last generation, that in 2011 he was just reaching for the most accessible, readily available re regime of representation and reason why this should become a symbol. But it's a colonizing reference, and I think he sidelined, um, I, I, I don't want to take a, anything away from Canadians of Scottish heritage being one of them, but um, he sidelined an opportunity to make this a symbol that's relevant to a far greater number of Canadians. And as I've mentioned, uh, he's undoubtedly unaware of the history of these Canadian tartans because I don't think that anyone else has really dug into them. And um, most importantly, they're creators and uh, did not belong to Canada's significant share of, of citizens who acknowledge Scotland as home of their forebears. For instance, David Weiser, born in the Ukraine, uh, came with his family fleeing pogroms to settle in Toronto. Henry Weller, creator of the Centennial Tartan, was Jewish. So was John Helpern, creator of the Pick Mills Tartans. So was Sam Wolanski, creator of the Newfoundland Tartan. Nor was the Nova Scotia Tartan created by a Scot or even a native-born Nova Scotian. And the Scots in Scotland did not take warmly to these Canadian Tartans. So when uh, Pick Mills, when John Helpern took um, his tartans on the road to London uh, and had um, uh, models wear them um, for the press, um, the press reported that the Lord Lyon would not register them, declaring them not tartans, but trade checks. And worse yet, uh, the press interviewed Dame Flora MacLeod of MacLeod, who opined that the idea of 11 tartans designed by someone who was not Scottish in fact, a Polish Canadian was, quote, absolutely awful, unquote. Um, so nonetheless, uh, in 2011, history was rewritten to correspond to a dominant ideology um, in, make, in, in making this tartan a symbol. And I think that perhaps it's not surprising that the official recognition has had little to no impact. Uh, it's fair to say most Canadians uh, don't even know of it. Uh, I think th those who do are very few and far between, so I, if you're, you are here and you do know of it or knew of it before, I, I congratulate you. Um, most significantly, this new work, Symbols of Canada, published late last year, uh, has chapters on some 27 symbols. Maple leaf tartan is not one of them. It's not even in a footnote. And what's more, the cover design is another tartan, Rob Roy not uh, maple leaf. And yet in 2010, uh, the tartan was used for, on the cover of this book, How the Scots Invented Canada, and has since the early 2000s has been worn in kilts by some uh, Canadian regiments. When the Duke and Duchess of uh, Cambridge visited in 2016, um, Kate place this scarf over her arm, as royals often do when they visit areas that have regional tartans. None of the media noticed this or made reference to it. Um, this is InfoMan, <laughs> who, who's on to move. Um, we know, we contacted him very recently um, because one of my colleagues had no, noticed that he wore I may believe Tartan Blazer. And so we wrote to him and said, you must be amongst the very few people that know that this is a symbol of Canada. And as it turns out, he had no idea. <laughs> and uh, neither does Francois Legault. <laughs> and in fact, in fact, and our poor prime minister is not here to defend himself, but InfoMan believes that Justin Trudeau didn't even recognize it because he made a remark about him looking kind of Christmassy in this interview. <laughs> Um, one uh, who, who is a champion of this tartan is uh, the American 
uh, Canadian-born American designer, uh, Michael Kay, who's plaid du, du Quebec dress uh, I showed you earlier. And he uh, used it for, again, in another edition of Dress to Kilt. Um, and here it's modeled by um, the Olympic um, ice dancer, Shaylin Bourne. Um, so as I've been thinking about the past, over the past year, I've been thinking a lot about the tartan's obscurity. And I've been thinking about what I see as a, a missed opportunity. And I found myself trying to reimagine how the tartan and how it might be made relevant, as it, because I think it's got many things going for it to make it uh, uh, relevant. And so I set about uh, scrounging for tartan. I borrowed some, I bought vintage, and I sourced online, and I shopped in souvenir uh, shops. And I began to think about how maple leaf could be the new black or the new black watch, if you will. And I began to wonder if I could ask people uh, to wear it and uh, reinvent, uh, wear it in a contemporary way and make it look up to date. And as I was thinking about this, I was thinking, what, what it really has going for it is greatest symbolic potential is that it's a testimonial to immigrant enterprise and a feeling of belonging in a land of opportunity and optimism to the extent that one uh, ventured to create, a, uh, the, well, several ventured to create popular symbols of their adopted nation. I think this is very germane to our current pre preoccupations with incurring uh, encouraging immigration. And not to mention that the allusion to the life cycle of the maple leaf is a potent reference in an age where our environment is amongst, or if not the most, foremost national concern. And for, foremost, this entanglement with fashion almost makes it a tool for freedom of expression um, when I ask people to wear it in a way that seems natural to them. And in fact, I realized it could be a particularly democratic symbol for people to wear as they wish and express on their bodies how they seamlessly integrate belonging to Canada with belonging to other identities, which becomes a particularly potent expression um, in identity, with identities that have been historically marginalized. And so to put this message across, um, and there's another one. Uh, and um, this, this uh, participant uh, is very interesting because I wondered how could I find an indigenous person who would actually buy into this idea of wearing a symbol of Canada and the answer was to make it Cree by embroidering traditional Cree motifs on it and the skirt that you see here is here for you to examine. And, and uh, Maite Saiganash, who you see here, wanted me to use her grandmother's name, Mary Jane Kitchen, when I explain um, that these are traditional cream motifs that she's taken from. Uh, and of course, she, but she wore it in a way that expressed um, uh, her plural and complex identity. So to put this message across then, um, the, the outcome of this project was a video that we created very recently here, which is now in social media to promote the potential of the tartan as a unifying symbol. And really the idea just comes from the topic itself. And I think there's been no other instance where I've been able to mix textile history and collecting vintage clothing with a statement uh, about inclusion uh, quite like this. And so... Without any further ado, I would like to play. Hi, I'm Cynthia Cooper, curator of dress, fashion, and textiles at the McCord Museum in Montreal. Tartan Day comes on April 6th, so let me help you get ready. Le tartan a toujours été symbole de l'héritage écossais, mais depuis longtemps, d'autres groupes s'en servent comme symbole d'appartenance. If you like the idea of styling your own way of belonging, then the maple leaf tartan might be for you. Le tartan de la feuille d'érable est notre symbole officiel le plus obscur, mais c'est possiblement le meilleur pour le Canada d'aujourd'hui. En fait, aujourd'hui, nos symboles officiels nous rappellent ce qui nous divise et non pas ce qui nous rassemble. Take the beaver, for instance. It has become a gnawing reminder of our colonial history. Now, while we can't wipe out our checkered past with a checkered textile, we might want to think about how it's a better fit for Canada's present and future. 
Le tartan de la feuille d'érable évoque notre environnement, une cause qui nous tient tous à cœur. Its colors trace the life cycle of the maple leaf. It's about the land, and that's a reminder of its traditional custodians. And it's a testimonial to the success of new Canadians. Ce tartan n'a pas été créé par un gouvernement, ni un colonisateur, ni un Écossais, mais un immigrant. Il voulait que ce soit un tartan pour tous les Canadiens et il voulait qu'on le porte avec fierté. And because it's a textile, you can get your tartan on any way it suits you. It even points out how identities are plural and complex and how that actually enhances our national fabric. So get your tartan on. I'm Cynthia Cooper at the McCord Museum in Montreal, wishing you the best tartan day ever. So that, that ends my presentation to you, but I'm very happy to answer your questions or hear your thoughts. Do you have any questions? Sixties, I worked for Fine and Tinker, and in the here, in the nineteen sixties, we produced a pile of Scottish tartans mm -hmm. for school wear. Mm -hmm. Made them in or wool because they were good. Made them like the Villa Maria wore them. So schools all across Ontario wore them. Mm -hmm. So tartans were worn woven for a long, long time. Yes. And, and it was very profitable. Yes. And um, I'm wearing today. The Montreal 342 tartan. Yes, I recognized when you came in, yes. Which is uh, registered by the St. Andrew Society and it's registered in Scotland. Mm -hmm. And if there was a mistake made, and you said before there was a mistake made, it would not be the register of Scotland who did it, it would be the mill who manufactured it who right. made the mistake. Okay. Because they only wrote what they were given. Right, right. Okay? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I should mention uh, uh, the maple leaf tartan um, uh, was also used in school uniforms. I know somebody's told me that she remembers a tunic with, uh, that she could wear with green, red, or gold tights. And um, I wasn't quite sure what this garment was. Um, and then yesterday, just yesterday, putting the finishing touches on this talk, I found that there was a school of nursing in Toronto that had um, uh, that used it in their capes and the bands on their caps, and so I think now that that's what this is, a nurse's cape. Oh, wow. nurse's mm. cape. Yeah. Other question? It can be in French or in English. Wait, okay. Other questions? Are, yes? Are all tartans registered throughout Scotland, or is there a specific area in Scotland where the, the registration takes place? Well, the, the register is a branch of the National Archives of Scotland. It used to be the, it used to be the Lord Lyon? Yes. And it's now been taken over by some y yes. strange government department that are used yes. by Scottish parliaments. Yes. Parce qu'au début, vous avez parlé que dans le film, dans la série Outlanders, puis l'autre film là qui se passe au Moyen Âge, Braveheart, oui, il y avait du tartan. Ça veut dire que c'est c'est faux tout ça Non, il uh, y, y avait des tartans. Uh, the question is about the history of tartan, and um, um, it existed. Uh, it existed for a long time, but it wasn't associated with clans. Distinct tartans were not associated with clans. They may, there may have been regional distinctions, and that's where the, the idea... Que, yeah. Par exemple, dans Outlanders, there, il y a des clans, mm -hmm. il y a des tartans différents, donc ça veut dire qu'il n'y en avait pas dans ce temps-là? Um, um, ils n'étaient peut-être pas divisés par clan ou associés avec des clans, comme on l'imagine aujourd'hui, ou depuis 1822. C'est 1822 que oui, ça a commencé? Oui, oui, oui. Euh, je serais curieuse d'aujourd'hui si on pourrait refaire l'exercice d'essayer de refaire un tartan pour l'unité nationale, dans le sens que la mode a également sa, sa valeur et puis sa, sa responsabilité face à l'identité d'un pays. Qu'est-ce que vous en pensez? Euh, 
so the question is if we would, uh, if we should recreate or think about recreating a tartan today that might foster national unity. I think that probably the idea, um, first of all, we have this tartan that has been around for a very long time and that in my personal opinion, still works visually. Um, and I think that David Weiser was right when he uh, described how he created it, thinking of subdued colors and so on. Um, and I'm, not, I'm still not sure this, this little film that we made, um, uh, I don't know to what extent, how far it goes to create unity, but I think it, it opens a dialogue about uh, how we belong and how um, clothing uh, can or can't allow us to belong. And if it creates a little shock that, oh, I didn't expect that to be made out of tartan, um, then I think that it's important that we think about why um, in 2019. I'm not sure that that quite answers the question, but I'm not sure that creating new tartans is going to take us any further <laughs> in that process. <laughs> Hi, um, Hi, my name is Isla. Uh, I am from Scotland. Mm -hmm. um, thank you for your uh, presentation today. Um, my question is, well, from the Tartans, each textile has a lot of symbolic, cultural, historical context. Mm -hmm. um, and for me, I, I'm at school right now, but when I graduate, I want to go into design. Mm -hmm. And uh, the textiles that I like personally and I work with are usually Chinese or um, Indian uh, embroidery and beadery. Um, and some people consider that an example of cultural appropriation. Mm -hmm. um, so you as a historian, I want to know what's your stance in a conversation of cultural appropriation or if someone is wearing uh, a textile simply for the aesthetic value without consideration of the cultural mm -hmm. significance. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I just want your opinion on mm -hmm. it. Well, I think cultural appropriation typically occurs um, when the appropriation is something that belongs to, uh, has come from a marginalized group, particularly when that has become a tool of of survival. Um, if I look at what Maite Saganash did on the maple leaf tartan, uh, I don't think that the maple leaf tartan um, uh, has ever been associated with any marginalized identity. It was very mainstream. But her embroidery has been um, a tool of survival for the indigenous women in her area. And um, so I would treat that with the greatest respect. Yes? Hi, um, I really enjoyed the, the lecture. Thank and you. my question is, um, is every weave called tartan or does it have to be registered to be called tartan? Like what I'm wearing now, I have no idea what it is. Would it be called tartan or does it have to be registered? Well, it has to be, to be registered to and there is typically a grid pattern, no matter how simple or basic it may be. It can be as simple as Rob Roy or it can be very complex, but there's, there are bands of color that cross each other, yes. So somebody who weaves something, they don't call it, they can't call it tartan unless it's unless registered. Unless it corresponds to an existing registered pattern. Ah, okay. Or unless they register it. Thank yes. you. Uh, well, some color seems to be excluded of tartan, like orange, pink. Is no, that I think, the, I think today there are, there are all there colors. There wouldn't be, yes, it was like yes, a tradition. Yes. Yes, hello. Uh, my question or curiosity revolves a possible tartan linkage to Montreal with regard to the Ogilvy's department stores. You know, mm -hmm. they have that mm -hmm. traditional boxes. And is that an actual tartan? The Ogilvy tartan is, yes. Yes. Was that developed here in Montreal? No. Um, I'm trying to think. We have a dress here, a very early dress from about 1861 in that tartan. Uh, worn by a member of that family um, to meet the Prince of Wales. Um, so it's been around at least since then and, and uh, before, I believe. I think that it's one of the earlier um, tartans that were published in a book in the 1840s, I believe. Thank you. Yes. Uh, questions? Merci. 
Good afternoon. Um, are tartans necessarily the 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 the, the regulate the square pattern, or are there elongated oblong squares in a tartan? That's a very good question, uh, because those. Pick Mills series of provincial tartans that I showed you um, uh, do have oblong squares. I think most, most tartans that I'm aware of, the same pattern goes in both directions. In those Pick Mills tartans, they do not. And then there was that comment made in the press that the Lord Lion would not register them, which is not quite correct either because I don't think that the Lord Lion... Well, the Lord Lion didn't make a decision, approve or not approve. They took note that they existed. Um, so I'm not quite sure what that, what was meant by that. Um, but in those tartans, they have two contrasting, uh, the bands that go in one of color in one direction are not identical in the other direction. So technically, um, is it a tartan? I'm not sure, but it, they are in the register of tartans. Tartans. Should, they, should be, they should be square. Yes, should be symmetric. Yeah. Have yes. Them. Yes. It's done by the number ends and picks that you have in the fabric. Right. It's supposed to be square. Yes. Because originally turns were made in single width cloth. Yes. But nowadays there's very few single width looms ex except in the Hebrides. Right. So they're woven in double width looms and the cloth is turned sideways. Therefore, they have to be square. Right. I mean, there is. There's skew in the fabric. I've seen pieces of maple leaf tartan where the squares have become oblong, but that's a weaving error. A weaving where the, problem, yeah. Yes, a weaving problem. And but the pick mills tartans are registered with a set that is not uh, not similar in both. It's not really a tartan. It's applied. <laughs> so, well, that's what they said in '67. Yeah, when, I need John Helper. Yes. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, wonderful. Yeah. Uh, he was quite the gentleman. Yes. 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 Oh, that's the, wonderful the to know. Quebec, yeah. Uh, unfortunately, like the rest of the textile trade, they went to China and India. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All those two places. Mm -hmm. oh, I'm glad to know. I'm glad to know that. Thank you. A question about uh, dress and yes. hunting mm -hmm. tartans. How did that evolve? Okay, I'm not sure that I can. Uh, I can answer that. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Did not exist in the hunt, hunting version. Okay. So if you take a simple royal Stuart, yes. it becomes dress Stuart. Yes. If you add it into, uh, if you add white into the colouring, stick some of the red out and you put white in. A hunting, uh, the returns that were dealt, developed later on after Sir Walter Scott's many wonderful dreams that he had about what life should be like in Scotland. And I just come from close to where Sir Walter Scott comes from. And he wasn't a very nice man. I just want you to know that. Did you knew him, Campbell? I didn't know I'm not that old. <laughs> but um, he, he, was, he was fascinated by old stories. He developed all these old stories and he did an awful lot for the Scottish borders. But he was the guy who brought the fantasy of this, the, you've got hunting turtons, you've got dress turtons, you've got Old tartans used by what the, the colours used to be like because the new dyes have changed everything. And so you've got ancient tartans which are made from the, like I have a kilt made in ancient Leslie, mm -hmm. which is what the tartans used to be like. Mm -hmm. It's not that like that anymore. Mm -hmm. But the hunting is just, it's just a variation on mm -hmm. the regular tartan, mm -hmm. which was worn for hunting. Mm -hmm. They also went on in Scotland to develop estate tartans. The tartan we saw uh, Camilla wear in there was a Bermoral tartan, mm -hmm. which was designed precisely for yes. Bermoral. Right. And so from there, the big estates all developed district checks. I mean, this is where the Glen check came from. And there's all kinds of Glen checks that are associated with estates in Scotland because they all wanted their gamekeepers, their, their, their dealers, everybody to be dressed the same. And it was a wonderful idea, but it was great for textiles. On a une autre question? Ah oui. Merci. J'aimerais faire suite à la question de Marie-Lisa pour les, les choix des couleurs, parce que tantôt, quand vous nous expliquiez les... Euh, oui les motifs. 
euh, à l'époque versus aujourd'hui, est-ce que chaque couleur a sa signification? Comme vous, vous nous expliquez votre, euh, vos origines avec l'Écosse et tout, est-ce que c'est toujours de cette manière-là par rapport au clan? Um, I think that this idea of colors, uh, that each color denoting something, uh, I understand that to be a mid-century innovation um, that came about with the regional tartans where they, they were referring to landscape features, trying to create... Um, symbolism of a territory that is distinct from another one, which was not so true the because the centennial tartan, they were obviously able to rewrite British Columbia's symbolism very easily to make it uh, pan-Canadian uh, and change what the red and white were for and so on. Mais alors, euh, merci. Euh, je pense qu'on qu a fait le tour. Merci. Euh, thank you, everyone. Thank you to Cynthia. I thank think you. Did you want to ask I, Yeah, something? I would just say one more thing. Um, so I mentioned, I have the samples of uh, the maple leaf tartan. It's correct. Uh, uh, in, it's correct. It's imitation. And it's more recent form. I have the skirt embroidered by Maite Saganash that you're welcome to look at, as well as the small... Uh, piece of Plaid du Québec, and I'd like to invite everybody to take a tartan square, and of, uh, we, we've, we're providing small squares of maple leaf tartan, and um, photograph yourselves and put it on uh, uh, social media and tag the McCord Museum, if you're so inclined. Thank you. Thank you.